Um, in this slide, we have uh, a question presented uh, earlier on. We did mention that the uh, another word for neoliberalism is the, or another term for neoliberalism is the term market fundamentalism, and of course, uh, we were saying with people like Bill O'Reilly and the rest, you know, that it's that there, there's this sort of a popular sentiment. Um, <clears throat> that uh, somehow the market is uh, the way forward and that the government should not be involved in the activities of the marketplace. And I think in this slide, really what we're trying to do is set out the argument that if, if people do believe that, you know, do they fully understand the stakes of, um, of that claim? You know, what do we gain? What do we lose if we put responsibility for allocating public goods and services into the hands of the marketplace and there are public goods that we probably do all of us cherish i mean everyone cares about clean air for example right everyone cares about clean water everyone cares about sewage everyone cares about roads everyone cares about basic public transport um, all of these things are provided only by the government, and there's reasons why they're provided by the government. Private services often do try to claim uh, that uh, they should be providing these services, but uh, and, and, and clearly, if you look at the Soviet experience, as we were mentioning a minute ago, there's, there's some reasons why private services can be better than public services in provision of some of those things. Um, and and some people argue that there should be subcontracting and things like that, and, and that's obviously part and parcel of what we're trying to flesh out here. This idea that maybe there's a happy medium between market fundamentalism and and absolute communism, so to speak. But um, the um, thing we need to understand, however, is that um, where the Soviet model. Uh, put an absolute priority on um, equality and often sacrificed choice. Um, capital, in a way, also sacrifices choice. And that's not something we like to think about, or tend to think about, rather, because we think that the market is, is the thing that excels at providing choice. And indeed, that's true. But, but only things that can uh, be made profitable. So, for example, um, what happens if capital, uh, as in private forces, uh, take over, for example, water? Well, pretty much in all of the experiences we've seen on a global basis, the prices go up, right? So if you're someone who cares about the question of justice for a society uh, where poor people have access to clean water, and let's face it, it's probably the number one thing that you can do to improve the health and welfare of a society is give everyone clean water. Um, if you make that a for-profit enterprise, as in you have to run it at a profit, you're basically making that harder to implement. The one thing about a private uh, firm running water is it has to make a profit. A public service doesn't have to make a profit. It just has to run at cost. And so um, water can then be provided at that cost, or it can even be subsidized if we care to do that. It could even be free if we care to pay for it out of taxes. So um, there's there's ways to make sure that poor people have access to some of these public services. Um, and of course, because clean water doesn't just benefit the poor, it benefits everyone, then it's just something we all benefit from together. I know there's a logic to that because if we all get together and act as a buyer, a collective buyer, if you will, you know what happens? Well, things get cheaper. If you go into the marketplace as one person looking to buy a wrench, um, you know, the seller gets to set his price and he gets to make a profit off you. But if you go in there as 100,000 people, each looking to buy a spanner or send one person in on behalf of you, obviously, we're not all going to go into the marketplace together. That would be a bit unrealistic. But we send a representative in to represent our collective interests and say, we are 100,000 people. We'd like to buy, buy all buy spanners, but we'd like to do it for cheap, right? And then the supplier says, hmm, well, I'd love to sp sell 100,000 spanners. Um, perhaps I could afford to compromise a little bit on my profit. 
and you know what happens, the price of the spanners come down. He get, still gets to make a profit. Um, he would not have otherwise sold 100,000 spanners, so there's a major incentive for him because of the security that he's getting from shifting that much stock. Um, the guarantee that he's going to move that much stock is great for him. So this really applies in the healthcare sector, by the way, uh, whereby many people argue that um, it's a really good idea to have government-run healthcare for the simple reason that uh, the government gets to buy all the drugs on our behalf and the private entrepreneurs who make the drugs are only too happy to sell the government the, that amount of drugs at a price which means that drugs become cheaper for the consumer um, because the consumer is pooling their resources together in their tax dollars and effectively uh, buying drugs for uh, for to, to, to sufficiently cover the needs of everyone um, the, 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 the drugs can be bought at a price that's closer to cost and the requirement uh, for profit of the provider is, is less in exchange for the guarantee of having that many consumers. So it's, it's just something that makes sense about the logic of public goods. Um, some people would say it's more moral, other people would say it's also more efficient uh, in the long run. Uh, it's just a better way to do things because we as the consumers save in the long run. Um, incidentally, I wasn't going to go into this, but if you're interested, um, uh, it's often said that Americans pay a lot more for their health care than Europeans. And actually, that's true. Over the course of your lifetime, if you take uh, all the money that Europeans spend, uh, you know, most of them, a lot of them will get it through their tax dollars, okay? But because they're pooling the resources and because they can get to use the logic of public goods to minimize the cost of their drugs and their services, in their healthcare bill, so to speak, their lifetime healthcare bill, and Americans don't get to do that because there's a for-profit healthcare sector to be taken care of, there's a for-profit insurance sector to be paid, and all of that um, profit margin for those uh, entities takes up a whole extra column in the, um, in the bill for the uh, American uh, consumer of healthcare. So Americans over the course of their lifetime tend to pay 30-40% I think, I, I, I believe that's correct, um, more over the course of their lifetime, they pay 34% more um, than the average European. Now, many people will say, ah, but you know, there's the in profit incentive and American medical services are way more advanced. It's true that you can get some things in America, um, sort of advanced experimental research, that kind of thing, that are perhaps less available in certain parts of Europe. But on the other hand, um, the vast majority of people will not have need for experimental um, interventions and surgeries. The vast amount of people just want basic health care. And so the real question there is, do those people get access to basic health care or not? I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a wonderful episode of the Oprah Winfrey show there about mm, back in 2006, 2007, where they went into um, a county there uh, in southwest Virginia the poorest county on the eastern seaboard of the United States of America and they were sending in third world style medical relief missions to provide cataract surgeries for people and other basic uh, medical treatments and it was all uh, basically run by um, uh, non-profits and um, it was being done much the same way that you would send a convoy of medical relief into a third world country and you have to ask yourself, in America, where there's you know, supposed to be a land of opportunity, how on earth is it coming to pass that uh, some parts of the country, uh, people are so poor that they cannot afford basic health care? Um, so there is a major argument there about the difficulty of uh, providing health care for everyone through a private system. Now, that's, uh, of course, a tricky argument to make in America because Americans generally... And in an American culture, um, most people believe in the myth of Horatio Alger, the Horatio Alger style myth. And of course, we see the insight here from farm boy to senator. And that's the idea that in America, Horatio Alger was a novelist and he wrote these novels that described how a little ordinary boy could pull himself up by his bootstraps and go on to become somebody great and a real success in life. And that's a deep, uh, deeply embedded myth of American uh, political life and public life and economic life. But is it true? Um, uh, neoliberalism 
likes to celebrate that vision. In fact, it likes to say many neoliberals, people like Francis Fukuyama, for example, who famously at the end of the Cold War said that the free market was the way forward and this was the end of history, he said, because there was no, never ever again going to be a need for an alternative political ideology or an alternative economic, economic ideology. A democratic capitalism is the way forward. And the question is, of course, um, you know, doesn't that obscure to a certain extent the problems that the Horatio Alger myth kind of covers up? If all Americans are going around thinking that their hardship is their own fault, or that anyone who's experiencing hardship is only experiencing hardship because they're lazy, then doesn't that really cover up a lot of the sort of social dynamics that have led to that hardship in the first place? I'm not saying there's no such thing as a lazy person, but if we look at the figures earlier on, we know already from our figures in this very hour that um, something on the order of 90% of Americans, that's 90% of Americans are getting by on just twenty-five, twenty-six thousand dollars a year. Um, that is kind of crazy, you know, that is not a lot of money. And so where does this myth of the prosperous American middle class really come from? If, if, if people don't really live that way, if that's not the realistic condition that most Americans live in, then clearly the Horatio Alger myth is failing. I mean, unless you're going to make the preposterous argument that 90% of Americans are lazy, which is kind of what... Um, our friend in the last election was was arguing uh, Mitt Romney got in terrible trouble for suggesting that 50% um, of Americans would vote for Obama because Obama would give them free stuff right and of course it's just a pathetic argument really in the end of the day um, to suggest that 50% of Americans are just lazy is demeaning and and frankly not true it's just not true uh, there's no evidence to suggest that 50% of Americans are lazy a lot of Americans feel uh, economically marginalized because there's a financial crisis going on at the moment. And that makes things very, very difficult. But, you know, the reality versus the Horatio Alger myth. You know, the reality is Americans often do try very, very hard and they don't succeed because the myth is just that. It's just a myth. It's not possible for every farm boy to go on to become a senator so long as he works hard. There is a system, an economic system out there and as we learned in the build-up to the last financial crisis, and as we look in more detail in the next uh, week, um, you know, a lot of the banks were practicing what's called predatorial lending. They were victimizing, they were, they were targeting um, suboptimal candidates for loans and telling them that they should borrow money uh, in order to buy a house or to put an extension on their house. And of course, the people couldn't afford it, but the banks were telling them that they couldn't afford not to because... Why wouldn't you get a mortgage this year for a house worth $20,000 when the inflation rate on the house is, is because of the property bubble, the house will be worth $30,000 next year. Wouldn't you be a fool to take out a mortgage, not to take out a mortgage at 20000 when you know you can pay it back and make a profit on the rising on the back of the property bubble next year? So there was a lot of predatory lending going on. And, and that is just one indicator, of course, of the fact that the market system can be very, very cynical and it can be kind of um, vulture-like. Um, preying on people who don't know any better and you know in a in a in a world a neoliberal world where public education is not being as well funded as it might be what basis do we have to say to people that they should have known better um, you know it's not their fault they don't have the educations anymore that they used to have and so because neoliberalism is eviscerating all the public services that Americans 20 30 years ago used to enjoy when this country used to be very prosperous it makes sense to think that um, that that people might make some bad decisions, and that it might be very easy for banks to 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 try to um, engage in predatory behavior um, on these people's uh, financial futures. Um, this is a quote that I like from Spike Peterson. I just thought I'd read this out for you guys. Um, um, she says the Horatio Alger myth and the logic of neoliberalism are kind of like a common sense. And we've talked about common sense before. We talked about Gramsci's definition of common sense before in this class. And so here, uh, you know, in keeping with the theme that we have in this course, we're looking at images of thought. We're looking at ways of making sense of the world. Uh, we're looking at, at uh, subconscious ideologies. 
And we're, I think, so here suggesting that neoliberalism has become something like a subconscious ideology for people. You know, if you watch uh, TV shows like Shark Tank um, and all the rest, you see that people are get very, very uh, particular about individual success and individual responsibility to change your life in order to turn around your economic hardship, to make something of yourself. Again, it's all just sort of coming back to the Horatio Alger myth. If you can make sacrifice, if you can make... Um, if you can tighten your belt, you'll get through and you'll come out the other side. And of course, the question is, at what point in time do people stop saying, hey, wait a minute, maybe this isn't my fault. Maybe this isn't down to me needing to tighten my bootstraps. Why is it, for example, in the context of the current financial crisis that my or my, my belt is the is the belt that needs to be tightened? and uh, Wall Street is getting a bailout for the risks that they're taking on the financial markets. That doesn't seem fair. Why is it socialism for the rich and not socialism for the rest? Um, so you have this um, question then here implicit in the, in the, in the quotation from Spike Peterson um, when she asks, what are the consequences of accepting this common sense uh, and the particular game of capitalism that it perpetuates? In the short term, Marginalized populations face daunting challenges, she says. How to secure immediate resources for family survival and well-being, and how to maintain self-esteem and optimism under stressful conditions and unpromising futures. In the long term, growing inequalities drain people's sense of inclusion in a global community, i.e. it doesn't feel very fair, and that's what we've been talking about, especially, I think, since the financial crisis. This was all written before the financial crisis. Increased feelings of frustration, uh, despair and resentment, certainly, perhaps even leading to criminality, you know. Uh, reduce the likelihood of people working together for common goals and undermine democratic principles which require inclusiveness. Um, so, you know, th th there's a, a knock-on series of effects in the short and the long term which um, uh, do a lot of damage to families. Um, it makes families nervous. It makes children feel stressed. Uh, stressed children are children are children who generally tend to have learning disabilities, and so you're going to perpetuate the problem of the lower classes through the fact that these children are not going to have very high self-esteem. And in the longer term, of course, uh, there's going to be resentment about one's position in the community. One's going to engage perhaps in scapegoating or conspiracy theory, theorizing even maybe to find out who is to blame. This is exactly what John Maynard Keynes said led to World War II because of the fact that um, Germans felt so um, economically marginalized by the uh, war reparations that they were foisted on them, that they had foisted on them after World War I. So, um, you know, there's a lot to, to, to sort of think about here. And, and even if you're someone who still, after all of this argument, still believes in the free market as the only solution, and you take that, that sort of extreme free market position, um, even if you want to continue to believe in that, that's fine, and you're very welcome to. And there's a lot to be said that is a good about the free market. But... Um, I think in an age where the free market is not rewarding the majority of people and is making, uh, leading to situations where certain very wealthy people like Mitt Romney, who is just unfathomably wealthy, is turning around and saying in the same breath, having been a vulture capitalist his whole life, um, that is, when I say vulture capitalist, I mean he's buying and selling corporations um, to, to, to sell off their hardware and their plant and their machinery to, to make a profit, right? He's buying up bankrupt companies to sell off their component stock. Um, that's what a vulture capitalist does. It's a very specific term. It refers to a very specific type of practice. But he's going to turn around having having sort of uh, been involved in the sort of dismantling of entire communities who'd grown up around uh, industries. Um, he's going to turn around and tell people who are unemployed that they're lazy. It's it's just too much, you know. And and so you can believe in the free market if you wish. But I think the thing you need to recognize is that you need to have an answer for people then if they come to your doorstep saying they're frustrated and they want justice, they want equality, they want their rights protected. Um, because as sure as the sun rises, eventually, as Jim Carville says, he was Clinton's former campaign supervisor, you know, if you hit people in their pocketbook, he came up with the phrase, um, you know, it's the economy, stupid, right? 
So I think at a certain point in time, people do think about their pocketbook. They do think about the fact that the jobs aren't there. And and eventually, um, one way or another, um, they start to engage in um, blaming someone, whether it's immigrants or capitalists, they shift to the right or they shift to the left. But either way, um, there's hell to pay because extreme political elements get empowered by that and there's a lot of social disruption. So if, if um, you, you, you really do have a very instinctive uh, sort of feeling that socialism is not a viable option for America, that's fine. But what I'm trying to say is that you need to be able to understand and think about a way that the free market can be made to work for everyone and not just some of the people. Because right now, if you look at the numbers, the top 10% are benefiting more than the rest. And the top 1% even are benefiting just incredibly much more than everyone else. And that's hard for people to take, I think, if they're on the economic margins earning $24,000, $25,000 a year. Um, life is going to be very difficult earning that kind of money, to be sure. So let's move on to our last slide for this week, and that is uh, a slide that addresses the question of Occupy Wall Street. Um, this is not in the chapter, but I thought I'd throw it in because it seems to sort of speak to some of the issues that were raised. As I said, Spike Peterson's chapter was written uh, before uh, the uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, issue became uh, apparent, uh, before Occupy Wall Street became a, a, a sort of a, um, a phenomena. Um, and it's really just a way of wrapping up the lecture today to say that all this flexibilization, all this precar precarious contracts, um, all this sort of uh, way in which lots of people are being driven into the black market, so to speak, the informal economy, it all seems to call the legitimacy of neoliberalism into question on, it, on their own. But then you add on top of that the financial crisis and you see that the legitimacy of financial neoliberalism is um, the, the legitimacy, legitimacy of financial neoliberalism is genuinely a question today. And this is a phenomenon in America that just was really, um, you know, has been unheard of since the Cold War because, you know, America typically, typically has a very strong, instinctive, negative feeling about socialism, about communism. But here come uh, a group effectively of anarchists um, are people inspired by anarchist ideology or anarchist, if not anarchist ideology, by the anarchist way of organizing and doing things. And there's a difference because a lot of the people who were involved in Occupy were not capital A anarchists. They were not self-identifying anarchists, but they borrowed a lot of the anarchist uh, way of organizing in order to, to bring their message onto the streets. And they used this concept, as we've been sort of trying to set out here, the concept of the 99%. That is to say that 99% of Americans have been marginalized and disenfranchised in one way, shape or form by the elites of neoliberalism, by the Wall Street bankers, by the very, very, very small minority who feel that they have um, the right to be entitled to a bailout for the risks that they've been taking with their money and with other people's money. And so the gentleman in the uh, photograph is an occupier holding up a famous sign where he says, shit is fucked up and bullshit. And this is a just, a, you know, a, a, what does that mean? It's, it's not even a demand, right? It's not like, I want justice. It's like, this is crazy. What you guys are doing is just nuts. You are the richest people in the world, not even just the richest people in America, but some of the richest people in the world. And you took huge risks with other people's money. And now, because you're so big, and the failure of your bank would literally capsize the entire uh, 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 sort of paycheck or salary system in the United States of America, you somehow get away with this bailout. It's just not right, you know? Um, all the people who lost their houses, all the people who, all the students who are um, graduating, having been told by society that they uh, should work hard, get a college degree, only to graduate from college and find out that they don't have the jobs there waiting for them. Um, there's, there's something outrageous about that, and it causes people to get angry. And that's where this anger of the, uh, the Occupy Wall Street phenomena came from. And so, interestingly, rather than demand communism or rather than demand socialism, they went out in the streets, they didn't make any demands, they simply said, we're angry, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. And they 
decided to implement as a form of protest on Wall Street what they call horizontal politics, a, a little encampment or a village, if you will, a community, if you will, of people gathered in the spirit of protest to hold up these signs, but also to organize themselves so that they could uh, manage their resources and stay there for a very long time. And it's really fascinating to understand the process through which they actually organized themselves. They they used a very, very, very non-traditional uh, form of democracy, uh, at least in our experience, to implement their strategy. Uh, we're used to representative democracy, where we vote for someone to represent us in a parliament or in a House of Congress. They were expressing their own vote immediately and every single citizen if you will of the occupy movement was able to vote directly so against representative democracy this was a form of direct democracy and they were implementing this and showcasing this form of direct democracy as a way of protesting um, about the corruption of representative democracy because what they see in the wall street uh, showdown so to speak where these uh, big banks were able to play Russian roulette uh, or chicken, if you will, with the rest of the American population and that the rest of the American population's wishes were so bluntly ignored, just as we saw in Cyp Cyprus last week, where there was an effort to ignore the population of Cyprus. Um, the occupiers are saying, you know, you, you guys are clearly corrupt, right? The, the, the representatives elected by the American people are clearly not doing their job because they are not protecting the interests of the 99%. They are protecting in bailing out these uh, large corporations. They are protecting the interests of the 1%. And so occupiers came out uh, to model this form of democracy as a way of protest against the corruption of de direct democracy. More than that, though, they also were very theatrical. And we, in our module on the media, discussed how the news media today has become increasingly hijacked by private corporate interests, CNN, Fox News. They're more interested in selling advertising than they are in telling the news. So um, what the occupiers were going to do was use theater to create a kind of a spectacle to counter the spectacle of our already existing politics. As if we remember our John Stewart sketch, our um, clip where we saw John Stewart go after and criticize the, the newscasters. Um, in that show Crossfire and CNN and tell them that they were basically being theatrical. Well, here came Occupy Wall Street to uh, engage in a form of theater of their own. And uh, again, this shit is fucked up and bullshit um, uh, idea here is part of the Occupy uh, phenomena. It's part of the Occupy approach. And it's certainly um, something that um, that was very sort of central in this, in the strategic um in, uh, intent of the Occupy movement to, to sort of create not just a form of horizontal politics and enact it, but to sort of present themselves to the world as a type of theater um, to sort of playfully, if you will, because what's the alternative? The alternative is to take up guns and sort of try to take over the government. They weren't going to try to do that, right? They, they were nonviolent protesters. They did not believe in violence. So they were trying to do the best they could with the resources they had to get the word out to get people's attention. And you know what? I think um, now that people know about the 99% and now that people know about the Occupy movement, um, this is the first time in a long time in American history that uh, people started talking about class, that people started talking about um, the, 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 the plight of the poor and the plight of the people who have been taken advantage of by the elites. And in a way, this is a very American thing but uh, it hasn't been seen in American political life for a very long time. And I think it's a testament to the fact that people felt really upset, genuinely upset, um, about, the, uh, about what they were seeing in the news, about what, the, what was going on in and around uh, Wall Street um, politically, uh, where um, the representatives of the American people were so clearly taking the side of the banks against the American people. And of course, Occupy then also has so many linkages with other struggles that were taking place around that time. If we think about Tahrir Square, which actually sort of predates um, Occupy Wall Street by a few months. Um, but, but, but there was a moment there uh, two years ago um, in, uh, in 2011 where, uh, where um, this uh, Occupy phenomena with its horizontal politics uh, seemed to be kind of speaking in some way, shape, or form with the um, 
the horizontal politics of the way the encampments were organized on uh, Tahrir Square in downtown Cairo in Egypt. Uh, similarly, we saw uh, encampments, horizontally organized encampments in Tunisia, in Spain, in Ireland, in Britain, uh, Germany, uh, Greece, in Syntagma Square in Greece, in Athens rather. Um, you know, so clearly there are these linkages. And I think it's it, it certainly seemed to encapsulate a, a moment where um, much of this sort of neoliberalism that we've been talking about suddenly for the first time in, in a long, long time uh, came up to be challenged um, in the popular discourse. And so that's the end of our uh, class for this week. Um, next week we'll come back and we'll have more lecturing um, on, um, we'll have another YouTube lecture, this time focusing on the readings from Kamek. We've already talked a little bit about Kamek, so again I'll be mixing and matching a little bit next week. But um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I certainly enjoyed preparing it and, 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 and speaking to you today. I'll uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care.